all, all, all I want to say is, um, just like books, the theme of this literature festival, uh, drag is uh, Atita as well. We warmly welcome you to the session. And we present uh, Avik Chanda and William Dalrymple. Good morning and a very warm welcome to all of you to the second day of Bangalore's Times Lit Fest 2020. Of course, the speaker of today's session needs absolutely no introduction, but the, the sheer pleasure of sharing the stage with him, albeit for a few minutes, um, delights me in, in conducting this ritual. William Dalrymple is undoubtedly one of the greatest, most prolific, and easily most beloved of all our contemporary historians. In fact, talking about us, Desis, I think it's no exaggeration to say that he, over the last two plus decades, has completely revolutionized the way that all of us think about the past, all about relate to our past, to, to history. Um, He's written a number of books, so I'll just give you a very small precy. Uh, he's the best-selling author of the Wolfson winning prize, White Muggles. Then The Last Muggle, which is my personal favorite, which won the Duff Cooper Prize. And also the Hemingway and Kapczynski Prize winning Return of a King. In 2013, he co-curated the exhibition Princes and Painters in Late Mughal Delhi, 1739 to 1857 with Yutika Sharma at the Asia Society in New York. In 2018, he was presented with the President's Medal by the British Academy for his outstanding literary achievement and also for co-founding the Jaipur Literary Festival. Um, more germane to this particular discussion, William Dalrymple is the guest curator of the exhibition Forgotten Masters, Indian Painting for the East India Company at the Wallace Collection. And the book, I've had the privilege of going through that over the last few days, the book that has emanated from this exhibition, um, the way I see it, William, it's, it's a celebration on several different levels. It's definitely a celebration of the many master painters hailing from across a spectrum of caste and community and socioeconomic background who undertook commissions from the East India Company patrons roughly between the 1770s and the 1840s, but for this exhibition and the very sensitive, empathetic cataloging, which chronicles not just the works, but their lives, I think many of these master painters and their names would forever have been lost to history. Similarly, um, it's, it's a salute to the eclectic tastes and sensibilities of the patrons, who in their own way were as, as diverse as the artists that they commissioned. And finally, I think the book commemorates the last phase of Indian artistic genius that was both deeply syncretic and also astonishingly creative before the twin assaults of photography and the influence of Western colonial art schools ended an unbroken tradition of painting which goes back to millennia. So, um, without further ado, Ladies and gentlemen, William Dalrymple. Thank you for uh, uh, getting up on a Sunday morning in time to make this session. <laughs> Bangalore's celebrated bars and nightlife have clearly taken their toll on a bit of the audience, but hopefully we'll fill up a bit as it, uh, as it goes on. Um, this is a, a talk about a show which is on in London and which um, will be moving to New York next year and we hope coming to India at some point, though the amount of paperwork that the government puts in the way of shows coming are, is, has to be seen to be believed, but we hope we'll get it here at one point. And it's the first major show celebrating um, a body of work which has been largely ignored because it's um, quite difficult to pigeonhole and classify. Late Mughal artists, as their patrons found their purses uh, getting further and further pinched by East India Company encroachments, um, found themselves losing their artists to East India Company patrons, who, um, on their own steam in general, rather, this was, um, the East India Company uh, was this sort of monstrous multinational um, which had as much interest in the arts as Goldman Sachs has. Uh, and. Uh, uh, had no interest in commissioning any painting really at all. But the individual patrons 
uh, employed by it uh, were very interested. Uh, and they commissioned a body of work from a diverse group of painters. Some of them Kalamkari textile painters from the Andhra coast, some of them court artists who'd previously been doing Durbar scenes and so on. Um, some of them uh, workers in stone who, 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 who turned their hand to doing architectural elevations. Uh, and these different artists, because their work is not quite Mughal, nor is it obviously uh, colonial, have fallen between two stools. It's, it, it's celebrated neither here nor in Britain. Um, and yet the fact is that these works, the best of them, are some of the greatest masterpieces of Indian art ever created. Uh, and today on the art market, leaves from the Impi album by artists such as Sheikh Zainuddin, uh, Ram Das and Bawani Das, or uh, leaves from the Fraser album by the Circle of Ghulam Ali Khan, go often for a third, a half, or even three quarters of a million uh, pounds, uh, are some of the most expensive Indian artworks. And it's an oddity that this work is not better known, either here or in, uh, in Britain. Uh, and we tried with this show to rescue this material, in a sense, from its limbo. It's always been known since the time of Mildred Archer um, as company painting, which is a translation of what it was called in Patna, which was company kalam. Uh, and uh, it's an unsatisfactory term, partly because uh, it includes within it a whole body of work um, which has nothing in common with it. The work produced by Mughal masters in a Mughal style has very little in common with the work produced by Kalamkari masters uh, on the Andhra coast. Um, so in, in, in one sense, it, it's a body of work that doesn't exist as a coherent whole. But more importantly, the, the phrase company painting puts the emphasis on the patrons and ignores the, uh, the, the work of the artists. It's, it's as if we celebrated the Sistine Chapel as being the, the work of Pope Julius II rather than Michelangelo, which is, of course, an absurdity. Um, so, and the greatest of these artists, like Sikh Jenadin, are um, the, the Michelangelos of their day and should be known. Their names should trip off the tongue as easily uh, as, the, as names like Rembrandt or Raphael. Uh, they should be taught in schools. People should be doing PhDs about them. But up to now, they've been almost entirely ignored. So this is an effort to push back on this. A word to begin with about the East India Company, in case any of you here weren't at the lecture yesterday. The company, um, at this moment in, in 1765, at the gifting of the Duwani, effectively pressed a switch which reversed a flow of money leaving the West into Indian pockets, which had been going on for more than 2,000 years. India traditionally needed or wanted very little from Europe. Europe, on the other hand, was very keen to get Indian spices, sandalwood, silks, and particularly diamonds, which left a huge balance of trade deficit in favor of India. Uh, and Western gold from Roman times onwards, as is shown by the coin hoards discovered recently by archaeologists on the Tamil and Kerala coasts, um, Western gold flowed into India. And this is the moment, in a sense, that the switch was turned. Uh, with the gifting of the Duwani, when Shah Alam handed over the three richest provinces of the Mughal Emperor, of the Mughal Empire, Bengal, Bihar, and Orissa, into the hands not of the British government, as textbooks on both sides uh, uh, tend to put it, but instead into the hands of one London business in this office, this extraordinarily small, five windows wide office. Not even the two buildings on either side. Uh, it's just the five in the middle, with a staff a hundred years after its founding. Uh, of only 35 people in the head office. So this corporation, which took over India by borrowing money from Indian, particularly Mawari moneylenders, uh, and buying Indian armies of sepoys, which it trained up to fight other Indians, soon spread over the subcontinent. And between 1756 uh, and uh, 80, uh, just before when well, Siraj Daula uh, engaging with uh, Clive in 1757 at Plassey, uh, between that moment and 1803, when the East India Company captures Delhi and takes Shah Alam under its wing, the East India Company, that, uh, improbably, a corporation, takes over the biggest empire in the world. Uh, and by 1803, the, uh, this one London company, uh, with its uh, directors and shareholders many miles away, um, is running India. Uh, and it's... Uh, building a third of London docklands. It's uh, 700 East Indiamen clippers are built a year to ferry 
uh, tea, opium, and silks and cottons around the world at enormous profit. It's the biggest single employer in Britain, and it has a private army of 200,000, which in 1799 is more or less exactly double the size of the British army. Uh, so this is, a, this is a corporation. This country was taken over by a company. And the East India Company was no more the British than Google is the Americans. And it's very important to understand this corporate basis uh, under which the East India Company operated. But behind all this and the shipping of, uh, of opium around the world and East India Company tea ending up in Boston Harbor, behind all this there is also a second story uh, which is uh, largely untold. And this is the story of how intimately the company interacted with Indians. Forget all the 19th century stereotypes of Kipling and Curzon, of white-only clubs, of no dogs and Indians on the Simla Mal, uh, of uh, civil lines where no Indian shall tread except servants. Forget all that, because in the East India Company, at the same period, as it is extracting huge amounts of loot from this country, it's also doing so in an entirely collaborative manner. It's Indian troops that are fighting for it. It's Indian moneylenders that are lending the money for it. Uh, and most of these men are intermarried with Indian women. Uh, in the 1780, between 1780 and 1820, one third of all British wills of the East India Company are leaving goods either to uh, Indian women or to um, uh, or to uh, Anglo-Indian children. And if you, if you work upwards from that to, these were Will's public legal documents which your family got to see back home. If you work up from that and presume that uh, uh, there's many more liaisons which did not get legally recorded, um, and by the sheer number of Anglo-Indian children that we know existed at this period, you can work upwards to imagining that at least half, probably three quarters of these India, East India Company people were cohabiting and ending up dressing like this on an evening by the Gomti. Uh, and this was not a, just a one-way relationship. Um, at the same time as John Wumwell, a Yorkshire chartered accountant, is dressed up like Shah Jahan, Ashraf Ali Khan, uh, who is this, uh, the, the major saltpeter merchant in Patna, uh, a Kashmiri who'd, who'd settled for several generations in Patna and taken over the saltpeter trade, which was the main ingredient both of gunpowder and more bizarrely, I never quite understood how this works, but the, the Mughals used to use saltpeter as a coolant for their drinks in the years before, um, uh, before ice. I'm not sure how, how, why putting saltpeter in your water cools it, but anyway. Um, Ashraf Ali Khan, as you can see, is wearing his Kashmiri clothes, but he's sitting on a Georgian chair, a Chippendale chair, and he's got his, his hookah race, uh, put up on a Georgian teapoy. Um, and so this is a sort of cultural... Um, uh, intermixture which is going in several directions at once. I love his duties on the ground just below his chair. His girlfriend uh, is sitting more correctly, more to be uh, properly in her uh, and very elegantly in her Chippendale chair by the banks of the, uh, uh, of the Ganges at Patna. So what is true of, s of social life and commercial life and the sexual life of the company is also true of the artistic life. And uh, this picture is probably Mazar Ali Khan, who is one of the leading artists in Delhi. And it's a very instructive self-portrait. Mazar Ali Khan is sitting, probably about 1820, uh, 1825, um, in the traditional Mughal posture for painting. Uh, you sit down on the ground, leaning back against a bolster. You raise one knee and you rest your paper on a wooden board. Uh, and you paint with a single hair from a squirrel's tail these incredibly fine brushes. And you use as pigments ground, uh, ground minerals, so lapis or malachite ground incredibly finely and mixed with gum arabic. Uh, and that is what's going on in the little uh, round oyster shells um, which are on the ground next to his feet. But on either side of those oyster shells are two boxes, and those boxes contain western watercolors. So you have the very first imported um, sets of watercolors. You see the blocks of color, particularly clear on the left-hand um, uh, box uh, to, to the left of the picture. Uh, you can see the yellows and the blues and the reds of a watercolor set. And this is probably you know, some, among the very, very first watercolor sets imported into this country. And um, Mazar Ali Khan, certainly in this uh, album, is painting on uh, Watman's watercolor paper. Uh, imported from England, and he's got a pair of rather English-looking spectacles. So art, like 
social life, like commercial life at this period, is hybrid, as India has always been. India has always absorbed diverse influences, whether it's the Persian influence on Ashoka columns or, or, or uh, uh, a million other Persian influences throughout the Middle Ages and the Mughal period. The same is true of the South. This is a recently rediscovered picture by an artist whose work we knew and, 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 and uh, was a very clear body of work, but uh, uh, no one knew what the artist's name was or who he was or what he looked like until three years ago when this picture turned up at auction in Sotheby's. Uh, and this, at the end of the album, which is being held on the right, this picture is still contained within the album, um, is a self-portrait by the artist Yalapa of Valor, uh, not so far from here, down the road. Uh, and he is it's an incredible self-portrait. Look at the self-possession and the sort of pride uh, and the self-awareness of that face looking directly at the viewer. He's painting uh, not in the Mughal fashion, interest, interestingly. He is painting instead on a tea chest propped up with two chocks. Um, he's got his two assistants. He's obviously you know, a well-to-do um, uh, artist with his own studio. He's got all his equipment around him. But like Masr Ali Khan, you've got the oyster shells on the ground to the left and the English watercolours up on the board uh, on top uh, where he's painting. Uh, so again, this hybrid art style. Uh, not just a, a matter of hybrid patrons and, and patrons coming from different worlds, but the actual art itself is a coming together of different traditions. And this is nothing new in Mughal painting. Uh, since the time the Portuguese started giving um, gospel books to Akbar, and uh, Akbar uh, encouraged uh, his artists to paint these Western um, nativity scenes and so on, European art had been filtering, often unrecognized, into Mughal painting, and perhaps nowhere more so than in painting in the painting of nature. This is a gorgeous uh, uh, page, um, I think from the Darashuku album, but certainly from the 1630s or 40s, of, um, of still life flower portraits. You take a look at it and it's immediately Mughal. But look what Eber Koch has found as its model. It's actually based entirely on a German uh, print uh, from the period and, and school of Dürer. Look again at that. There's the Mughal version and there's the preceding uh, uh, German print. Then um, you have something as familiar as the Pietro Dürer inlay at the Itmadu Daula. Uh, look at the vase there and compare it to this print. So these influences often impossible to spot in their transformed Mughal incarnation um, were happening from the beginning in Mughal art. So what was happening with the East India Company was just another layer in a sense uh, 